Some cold weather, right? Super cold. What's up? Uh, it should be CNS number three. Uh, it's the last part of two then. Yep. Someone's asking about the slides. So it's the, it, there's only two lectures posted. It's the last part of two. I think today we'll, we'll actually finish a little early. And I'm happy to stick around and do a little review. All right, that's answer some questions. What's happening on Wednesday? Exam. Wow, someone's excited. Shazam. All right. Exam three. I should know the drill at this point. So we've got tonight, 6 to 7 p.m. in Bio 260, a review session. Tonight, 7 to 8 p.m. in Science Annex 117. And then tomorrow, you've got 11 to noon, Science Annex 117. So three more review sessions for you, okay? I'll have office hours tomorrow as well as Wednesday. I'll post those, but they're kind of what they normally are. Tomorrow's 1 to 2. Wednesday is uh, about 2 o'clock to 3.30. Okay. The 7 to 8 tonight is Science Annex 117. You're welcome. I actually think this last little lecture is kind of fun because we get to put some things together. But before we get into the action, who earns a living driving people away? Who earns a living driving people away? A taxi driver. Well done. What stays in a corner but travels around the world? Stamp. A stamp. Well done. Two for two. Somebody looking over my shoulder here? What kind of animal would, would you never play poker with? A cheetah. a cheetah. Very well done. Three for three. I am so proud of you all. Unbelievably proud of you. You too can be funny. You just need note cards. All right, so let's get started. It's the last lecture on central nervous system. We've done pretty well getting through the material. We stayed on task, and um, I think we'll finish a little early, and we can have some time for some review if you'd like, okay? What we're going to talk about today is the second part of lecture two, where we're talking about the spinal cord how things are organized as you move from the central nervous system brain to central nervous system spinal cord. Now remember, what's some of the purposes of the spinal cord? Do you remember that from the last time we were together? Locomotion. Connect the PNS to the brain, or, or specifically the CNS, but the portion of the CNS that we're interested in connecting it to is the brain. Okay. What else? There was a third one. Reflexes. It's, it's like you've studied or something. That's pretty impressive. That's great. So now we're in the central nervous system, but we're in the last part, which is the spinal cord. Last time we got together on Wednesday, we talked about some diseases. Like we talked about exaggerated thoracic kyphotic angles. We talked about uh, spondylolithesis. We talked about whiplash. Remember the alar ligaments and the transverse ligaments being torn in a whiplash injury? Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit more heavily on reflexes and how they work and why they work. And the spinal cord is really important for these reflexes to be able to be operational. So you have to imagine this prep. This is a spinal cord prep. Do you all see the butterfly? So that butterfly is the gray matter, okay? And you've got gray matter in the middle that looks like an H. Some of you are like, I don't see a butterfly, Keller. It's the darker portion that kind of makes an H. You've got a dorsal portion towards the posterior aspect. You have a ventral portion towards the anterior aspect. And this column is, is a slice, so it's like a slice this way, 
and then you're looking at it like that. So it's kind of coming out at you, and anywhere along the spinal cord, you're going to see something similar to this, maybe not identical. You'll see the gray matter with the dorsal horn and the ventral horn. So here's the dorsal horn, here's the, and here's the ventral horn, okay? So you've got a dorsal horn here, dorsal horn here, ventral horn here, ventral horn here. So you have peripheral nerves that will come in sensory towards the posterior dorsal aspect, right? Sensory information towards the back. Then these red tracks, so those are groupings of neurons that collect sensory information. Now, this also exists on the right side, but they're dividing the preparation on, I'm sorry, this is the patient's right, this is the patient's left. My bad, correct? So they're showing the patient's right side. These areas right here on the left are also lit up, correct? But we've got ascending tracks from the left side of the body, sorry, excuse me, the right side of the body. They're going to come up and they're going to move over to the left side of the brain. And that word is a fancy word we call decussate. Bless you. Okay. Sounds like kazuntite or something in another language. Decussate. It's not what you say after somebody sneezes, but it sounds like it. Decussate means crossing over. So let me repeat, because I messed that up a few times. This is the patient's right side. The sensory information comes in the dorsal root horn to the patient's right side, comes up. We'll see it cross over to the left side of the brain as we move up higher. And you probably read about that if you did the reading. As we send information down from the brain in the green tracks, they're highlighting it on the patient's left, but those do exist on the other side of the body. Does that make sense? So these red areas are also found here. We're just showing the prep, right? Patient's right, patient's left, and separating sensory in red and motor in green. But a lot of students get confused. They're like, so there's no ascending tracks on the patient's left side. That's weird. That's not true. Does that make sense what I'm explaining in this picture? This area right here that's you know, synonymous with this area is also red. They don't show it because they're trying to make it clear of where the descending tracks are in green from where the ascending tracks are in red. But they're very close to each other. If you look at the real estate, more of the sensory information is towards the posterior aspect, which should fit with what we talked about in the brain. So the spinal cord is organized in the same fashion, back to front, sensory towards the back, motor towards the front. Now, it's not hard and fast because you can see, well, Keller, there are some sensory tracks towards the anterior aspect, so that convention is not perfect. No, it's just what we define it as. We, we notice that and we say there's a propensity or there's a, um, a favoritism of having the sensory information towards the posterior aspect. Likewise, the green tracks are more centered towards the anterior aspect or the ventral aspect. You all see that? Just like what we had in the brain. So <clears throat> we see lateral horns. So this is considered the dorsal horn. These are the ventral horns. Now, there are lateral horns, T1 to L1. We don't usually talk much about them. But the lateral horns are sympathetic nervous system, and they're kind of taking care of things that are happening with the thoracic and abdominal cavities, whereas these are periphery out into the extremities. So we like to talk more about those. We emphasize those, and I will emphasize those as we ask questions. Like we kind of mention the lateral horn, but you won't see any questions about it on the exam. Now, <clears throat> the white matter tracks. The white matter tracks, the myelin, the white matter is these bundles that carry signals from one part of the body to another. And they send signals up and down the spinal cord. So as these tracks these axons come in and then they go up to the central nervous, up to the brain. This is the central nervous system, but up to the brain. They're going up these ascending tracks. Typically, they're white matter tracks, so they move faster. We're going to see here in a moment that you can bring sensory information in the dorsal root horn. 
you have an inner neuron that'll connect it and send it right back out the ventral root horn. When would you want that quick feedback to come in the backside of the spinal cord and then out the front? Simultaneously, they're sending a signal up to the brain so you can tell what's going on, but you really quickly send an inner neuron. You send one this way and then one that way. Why would you do that? Reflexes. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on. So this is the organization. And the architecture helps to facilitate this functionality of reflexes. It works really well. It's kind of in this circular pattern. You can send some, something up to the brain or the central processing unit, the CPU of the computer. But you can handle things locally for quick action, quick activity. That's one of those things like, you know, you touch a hot stove and you move your hand away. And then a moment later, you're like, wow, that's hot. You actually have the cognitive thought of pain or heat or it's sharp after you've retracted your body segment. Has that not always just fascinated you how that happens, right? It's like, wow, the, the pain response must be slower. The, the temperature response must be slower. Well, it's because at the local level, we've been designed with these reflexes to preserve ourselves and keep us out of danger. Okay. So the dorsal root horn handles all the sensory information, and the ventral root horn handles all the motor information. That motif stays. Okay, so the red and the green is a little messy. Sometimes students get caught off guard, and they kind of like, well, I thought, I thought there'd be this nice delineation right down the midline, and all the you know, posterior tracks are all sensory and all the anterior tracks are motor. That's if you were an engineer building a robot. Okay, that's how you would do it. This is biology. But the electrical pathways coming in the posterior aspect and going out the front stay. They're intact with that motif. Okay, how do we organize these nerves? I want you guys to take a peek at this. I want you to talk to your neighbor and tell me where you think you've seen this shape architectural design in this semester? Where, where, does, where have you seen this already? That wasn't a very like long group activity, but nicely done. It was muscle, okay? Anybody need more time to process that, want to talk to their neighbor, have a group activity, or are you just going to go with muscle? It, muscle's totally right. Can you see that? Does it kind of look like muscle? We haven't talked about muscle, so that would be Correct, but that's actually what I was going to say we're going to see because we haven't really talked about muscle. Now, you've seen it in lab, right? Where have we seen it in lecture already? Muscle is not incorrect, but we've seen it already in this class in lecture. Bone. Okay, bone. So a lot of shapes and architectures and structures are preserved in biology because they make sense. And so if it makes sense to organize it that way, you're not gonna reinvent the wheel, okay? Wheels are still round, even on Teslas, okay? And steering wheels are still mostly round, right? So let's, let's dissect this out. Down at the very basic level, we've got an unmyelinated nerve fiber in yellow, and then we've got a myelinated nerve fiber that's yellow with the white myelin wrapped around it. Around that, you can see this green wrapping, which is the endoneurium, endoneurium that surrounds the nerve. Now you can see that there's a grouping of unmyelinated and myelinated nerves, and there is a wrapping of those called the perineurium. Perineurium. Remember, endosteum, periosteum, same terminologies, endo meaning inside, peri, peri like perimeter meaning outer covering. So now we have this perineurium, outer perimeter covering. Inside of it are unmyelinated and myelinated nerves. As you look at this bundle, you can see the yellow ones and then the yellow ones with the green wrapping. So you know you have unmyelinated and myelinated. Well, we can group a number of these together and surround these with the epineurium. That means on top, epi, like epidermis. So endo inside, peri around the nerve bundles, epineurium 
is around all of these fascicles because this individual bundle is considered a fascicle that the perineurium is wrapped around. So this is just the architecture of how these nerves are organized. They look like wire cables, in my opinion. They look like if you go into like a computer room or a smart room in a, in a house or a building that's being built, right? you open up that closet and there's all these flashing lights and these racks and all these wires coming in. This is kind of how your electrical system is organized in the body. It's pretty cool. A scanning electron micrograph showing that architecture here. And you can appreciate the vein artery bundle, right? Blue for the vein, red for the artery, because this needs to be vascularized, just like what we saw in bone. You can't go very far because of the dis diffusion distance of oxygen, and nerves take a lot of energy. Highly metabolic tissue. Okay, let's move to the tracks going up, ascending tracks, going down, descending tracks. So ascending tracks, going up to the brain. Ascending tracks are a collection of nerve fibers to the central nervous system. They're coming and bringing in information. They're collecting information from the periphery. They're sending it up to certain parts of the central nervous system, the brain specifically, to give information about the outside environment or the periphery that this information is coming from. So we've got a couple of terms, but first before we get to the terms, let's dissect out these different levels of the central nervous system. So down here is the, prep, the preparation that we just got done looking at, like with the butterfly or the H. We've got our dorsal aspects, we've got our ventral aspects. You can see it's sensory information because it's coming in the posterior side. You know it's sensory information. It moves up at the level of the medulla oblongata. It decussates, that's our first term that we already defined. That's a crossing over to the other side. Decussates, that information then travels further up to the thalamus, the relay center that we talked about, then the thalamus dictates where it goes in the brain. And here it's going up to the somatosensory cortex, the post-central gyrus, bringing in sensory information from somewhere in the periphery. I get a lot of questions from students of, why does it cross over? Don't have a great answer. There's theories. There's evolutionary theories as to why it crosses over, okay? In more complex organisms, when we went um, from uh, quadpedal to bipedal, we started doing these complex motions, and it was more efficient to have these neurons switching over at the level of the medulla theory. Hemidecussate. Hemidecussate is a word that means half the information crosses, half the information stays. So an example of hemidecussate is the arrangement of fibers in the optic nerve. You'll see this in lab and in lecture when we talk about special senses. So at the level of the optic chiasm, where you're bringing in visual information, you send half of it to one side of the brain and half of it to the side that it came from. So you're getting binocular vision and you're coordinating those images. That's hemidecussate. That's kind of the best example that I know of. Contralateral is a term that we say meaning the other side. So you would say this in a sentence like, the information comes up from the patient's right side in, let's say, L5, moves up the spinal column to the medulla oblongata. It decussates to the contralateral side and then moves up to the thalamus. Contralateral is the other side. Ipsilateral is on the same side. Ipsy meaning same. So ascending tracks, sending information, sensory information up to the brain using ascending pathways. Okay, what do you think about descending pathways? I mean, this is how everything connects, right? So now we switched over to green in these slides. So we're illustrating motor information coming out of what part of the central nervous system? Where in the brain is the motor output? Hmm? 
No question, no, no answer. Precentral gyrus. Pre gyrus is motor, towards the front, correct? Precentral gyrus. So here, it's right up here, motor cortex, precentral gyrus. If it's on the patient's right side, it comes down, decussates at the same level at the medulla oblongata to the contralateral side, right side controlling the left side of the body, out the ventral root horn or out the anterior aspect to some skeletal muscle to flex the leg, okay? Extend the arm. Make sense? Coordinates limb movement. So now you know where it crosses over, both going up and coming down. There's a number of different spinal tracts located within the spinal prep. I am not going to test you on these. For sake of completeness, I want to show you them. And as you move on in your studies, you'll actually deal with many of these different tracks. And you can probably appreciate if there's damage, like a motor vehicle accident, trauma, an athletic injury. I was down in the valley um, this weekend. I went to a conference with my, with my lab, uh, a microscopy conference, and talk about a group of nerds, my gosh. You know, I thought I was a nerd, but you go to like a nerd of nerd meetings and you're like, wow, I don't understand that slide. I'm gonna have to look that up. Femtosecond. I had to look up, fem did anybody know what a femtosecond is? It's a very short amount of time. There's a microscope that I saw a presentation on that will capture information in femtoseconds. Somebody Google it. One, mil one millionth of one billionth of a second, I think is what it is. Somebody Google it real quick. Femtosecond. Am I right? Nobody's, nobody's GTS in that? Come on, I gotta look it up? Femto. Anyways, as you all, oh, I know where I was going with that story, sorry. It had nothing to do about microscopy. I got like sidetracked on a sidetrack. Down in Phoenix, at a conference, a microscopy conference, and then I went to my kids' track meet and then a soccer uh, tournament. At the track meet, how many, how many, uh, Track athletes, okay. Uh, any decathletes? Any pole vaulters? Okay. Anyways, I'm watching pole vaulting because it's pretty cool. This kid went up, cleared like 13.6, then went to do like 13.7, and I mean, up until that point, like he was just sailing over this thing. He hits the he hits the post. He gets caught up in it. And he's got the pole itself that they, you know, launch off of. So he's got the pole that he's jumping over, the pole that he's holding. So he tries to drop them. He comes down, puts his arm out to catch himself. Wha-bam, like a fracture. I was worried he was going to fall on his back weird because he was like all twisted. And there's two poles falling down with him. And I was worried he was going to have a spinal cord injury. So you can imagine as you move on in your studies, you will look at all of these cortical spinal tracts, vestibular spinal tracts, tectospinal tracts, lateral cortical spinal tract. All of these will correspond to different types of sensory or motor abnormalities if there's injury or trauma or damage. Like it, it, it surprises me in athletics that we don't have more aggressively problems that we're dealing with medically, right? I mean, fractures, the kid broke his arm, and I mean, that, it looked bad, and, um, but it'll heal really quick, you know, and nothing was wrong with his neck or his back or his spine. So I'm not going to, I'm going to repeat this, I'm not going to test you on these, but I want you to appreciate the real estate and the very highly specific areas that if you have a tumor, you have a lesion, you have an abnormality, that's what gives rise to a lot of these disease states. Fair? Okay. Let's talk about plexi, though. So this nerve plexus that we have in the body, a nerve plexus is a network of intersecting nerves. It's not just one. It's a complex network of intersecting nerves. In the thoracic region, we don't really call it a plexus. It doesn't really emerge in the thoracic, but in the cervical 
and in the lumbar region you have plexi. And if you look at the cervical region, you're seeing like, for example, here's C5, here's C6, here's C7, here's C8, and then it gets to T1. And you can also appreciate here on like, for example, look at C7, right? This plexus, this dorsal scapula nerve that comes down, C7 innervates, this actually controls things at the level of the arm at C7. So this plexus, if this is damaged at C7, right, and C7 is kind of the most prominent bump on the back of your neck. So if you fracture the neck, like my pole vaulting example that I was, I was like, oh, crud, oh, he just broke his arm, great. And everybody next to me is like, you are messed up, right? I'm like, it's just his arm's going to heal. It looked horrible. I think it's compact fracture. I don't think it's supposed to bend that way. But I'm all worried he's going to fracture his neck. At C7, does the patient have upper arm control at a C7 fracture? Typically not. It's pretty low on the neck. Okay, C1, C2, C3, it's pretty obvious. But at C7, there's a high chance that the patient is going to be quadriplegic. Because of the architecture of these nerves, the auxiliary nerve comes off of the C7 plexus. The radial nerve, there's some aspects at C6, so you might have some movement or some sensation. Do you see how like convoluted and overlapping this is? But this is where these cervical injuries translate and why we study these plexi. So a plexus is singular, plexi is plural, cervical, brachial, sacral, and coccygeal. All right, review question. We kind of asked this question already. You kind of answered it. But which analogy is the best comparison of axon is to endoneurium? Axo is to endoneurium. Any ideas? C, compact bone is to periosteum. If you were going to modify that question, do you have another word you'd like even better? Compact bone to endosteum versus periosteum? I would agree. But the other ones just don't fit, right? Because you're talking about a covering around the nerve. You're having a covering around the bone. Okay. Now we're going to move into reflexes. Okay, so here is an example of a question that I'd like you to think through. It can be a challenging question, but let's, let's dissect it. The left postcentral gyrus receives information about the texture of a fabric you're touching with your hand. Along which spinal nerve did this signal enter the spinal cord on its way to the brain? So what are the important terms? Let's, let's do a little test question dissection. Shout out some important words in that paragraph question. Left, I would agree. Postcentral gyrus, is that important? Yeah. Do you need to know for this question? Maybe not necessarily. You need to know the left side. But the question could be asking something else about the information, right? Fabric you're touching with your hand, which spinal nerve? So let's start with, we've got A and C are posterior or anterior? Posterior. Do you like A and C or do you like B and D? Why do you like A and C better? Because sensory information comes in the posterior aspect. I like that. Okay? If it went to the left postcentral gyrus, where did it come from? From the right, and it decussated where? At what level of the brainstem? Medulla oblongata. That's more information than you need to know. I'm kind of using this to, to test you. So if it's, it terminates or innervates on the left and it came from the right, do you want A or C? 
A, because that's the patient's right side, correct? Everybody follow that? Do I need to redo it? Now's the time to ask. Okay, I mean, it, it should, if you understand it, it's pretty simple, right? If you understand some of these key concepts. If I asked a question a different way, could you do it? What if I asked about motor output? Could you go the other direction? Can you tell me some of these things about what happens along the way, about where it decussates? Okay, now in the last little part of today, again, like I said, we're going to finish early and then we'll have some review time. If you want to stay, it's up to you. I don't know who's playing NCA right now, but my team's not, so it doesn't matter. Parts of a reflex. So we said that the spinal cord exists for locomotion, right? Think about other vertebrate organisms, like the family dog. Instead of the spinal cord going like this, the spinal cord goes like this, right? And it tells information like, you don't think about this. But when you walk, you walk just like your dog. When you put your right foot forward, or sorry, excuse me, your left foot forward, Right? You, swing, you swing your arms opposite that your legs move, just like your dog walks. You don't even think about it, unless you're texting, right? Then you're doing this. But when you're walking, you're doing this, right? I'm exaggerating. You with me? Now, if I was an animal and I'm doing this and I'm down on all fours, that's the locomotion, and that's exactly what your dog or your cat does. That's one of the purposes of the spinal cord for locomotion and to coordinate those activities, which is a complex activity. Imagine if you're a dog and you get it backwards, you trip, right? So we were in Greece on this island of Santorini and we were watching these mountain goats. Have you ever seen mountain goats like in a pack? They were on the side of these cliffs and then they walked on this roof of this church which I think they're going to hell for, but I'm not sure. Uh, and they were just navigating these things like it was no big deal. They're just like hopping around, jumping around. How many of you are hunters? Anybody hunt big game? Okay. Where some of your big game can go is crazy because they actually have four legs that are, right? You're, they're all-wheel drive. They are all-wheel drive, and you are two-wheel drive chasing after them. They are at a huge advantage. The spinal cord, locomotion, okay? That's this, right? Wait, hang on. I got to I got to do this. I got to do this right. Oh, no, it's this way and then this way. Right? See, I'd be a horrible dog. I'd trip. If I was that mountain goat, I would have fell. Then the priest would have caught me and I definitely would have gone to hell. So, <clears throat> we talked about sending information up. The third purpose, reflexes. But reflexes really do keep us alive. And you don't have to think about them so you don't spend a lot of time giving them attention or the credit that is necessary. So let's look at the parts of a reflex as we dissect them. Four main characteristics of a reflex. You should write these down. Number one, they're stereotypical. That means they essentially occur in the same way every time. They're rapid, very rapid. They're involuntary. Think about our example of touching the hot stove or something sharp. And they need stimulation, meaning they have to have sensory input to respond. They have to have sensory input to respond. So they're made up of a couple of different parts, and some of this should look familiar, like this spinal cord preparation. And then you can start to see that we've got an extensor muscle and we have a flexor muscle. They go in opposite directions. That's important because they're both involved in the reflex. Because if your reflex is to stimulate the flexor, you actually want to inhibit the extensor. Let me re re rephrase that. And this is where a lot of this information will come together and be synthesized. Remember IPSPs and EPSPs? 
If it's an EPSP, it's an excitatory postsynaptic potential, right? Excitatory means it makes it more positive, and you can stack them temporally or you can stack them by magnitude. And if you have multiple excitatory postsynaptic potentials that stack up to threshold, then you fire what? An action potential. You can go the opposite direction. You can have inhibitory IPSPs, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, that brings the membrane more negative, making it less likely to fire refractory or inhibitory. A lot of students are like, why would you ever do that? That seems like such a waste. This is why you do that. If your reflex is to flex, then you want to inhibit the extensor. If the reflex is to flex, to save your life, get you out of danger, prevent harm, then you need to actually prevent the opposite action from happening accidentally. Pretty amazing. must be really important if you're going to build neuronal infrastructure to do the, op do the opposite on the opposing, right? So it's like taking your foot off the gas but also having a brake. Like if you drove with no brake, you're like, eventually I'll stop. I just take my foot off the gas. But the fact that you take your foot off the gas and apply the brake gives you more control than just taking your foot off the gas and slowing down. So that's what this is all about, is actual control. IPSPs and EPSPs, the best example of aha moment for students is talking about a reflex. Because here we've got a muscle spindle, which I'm going to talk about in a second. That's a structure inside the muscle that is stretched and gives you information. And then it sends a signal, primary afferent is a term that means sensory. Primary afferent with an A. Efferent with an E is motor. That's how you know if you're talking about sensory or if you're talking about motor. So primary afferent neuron in yellow is, is triggered. It goes in because it's sensory, the posterior aspect. Do you see these little connectors? These are called interneurons. They connect this right back out, the ventral root or the anterior root horn. You've got a red one that comes down here and activates the muscle to contract. You've got a blue one that comes over here to the flexor muscle, right, that is the antagonist, and it relaxes it. Simultaneously, you've got this arrow saying, I'm sending some information up to the brain, and usually when you're in the doctor's office and they do that, you're like, oh, look at that, right? Oh, wow, it just kicked. Right? It kicks, and then you see it. Isn't that kind of weird? But that's how this is all set up. That's so an inhibitory postsynaptic potential goes to this one. An excitatory postsynaptic potential goes to this one. Make sense? I know some of you ask me, like, why do we even have these inhibitories just to make it confusing and give Dr. Keller more test questions, right? Yeah. Yeah, they do. We're, we're going to keep it basic. So for purposes of our class, on our effector organ, like what the motor output is going to, if it's somatic, it's skeletal. If it's visceral reflex, it's either smooth or cardiac. And there are some other subcomponents. But somatic is a term that means like a body cell. And that's something that you typically would have voluntary control over. But in a reflex situation, you don't. You have knowledge of it happening, but you don't necessarily have voluntary control. You also have visceral reflexes that manage your heart rhythms as well as your GI tract. Okay, these reflexes that, you know, your stomach starts growling and you're like, ooh, I must be hungry. There is a reflex that's telling you that information. <clears throat> you, um, you have too um, low of a pH in your bloodstream. Your blood is acidic. There's a reflex in the aortic arch. The aorta just comes right off the heart. There's receptors there that will tell your heart and your body your, through your brain, I'm slightly acidic. You'll see this in 202. So that reflex 
is a baroreceptor reflex, and you will start increasing heart rate and increasing respirations. So as you exhale more, you blow off CO2, which takes hydrogen ion out and actually raises your pH or makes it less acidic. This happens without you even thinking about it. So these reflexes, we're talking about skeletal muscle here, but the visceral smooth cardiac, we're setting the stage for all these reflexes that you're going to see as time moves on, okay? For pressure, for pH, for respirations. It's, it's pretty amazing. You have a lot of this automation. You're kind of like the luxury package. You know, when you buy a car, like you have all the bells and whistles in you. Okay, we're going to talk about the muscle spindle, which is this structure that I alluded to. <clears throat> we're going to fillet this thing open. It's found within the belly of a muscle. And it gives information about the muscle being stretched. So it tells the brain information about changes in muscle length. And, and it, it's really a, a protective mechanism so that you don't overstretch the muscle. We've got a couple of different features that I'm not gonna test you on. Some of you are like, sweet, today is awesome. I don't want to put too much on you because Wednesday we have the exam and it's all new material. But we have a lot of material. So I want to get through everything and have you exposed to it, but I'm minimizing the details so that there's not a lot of extra stuff you have to study in the next 24 or 48 hours or whatever we have, okay? But the way this is organized, so I do want you to understand that this gives you information about changes in muscle length, right? That's what we were talking about here. I'm trying to integrate all this information so there's some kind of light bulb moments where you're like, okay, now I understand what EPSPs are for and IPSPs are for. But these intrafusal fibers and extrafusal fibers, the intrafusal are inside, the extrafusal are outside. And they do slightly different things. They have different types of fiber or architecture and innervation. But if you can remember that the muscle spindle gives me information about the muscle being stretched and changes in muscle length as a protective mechanism so you don't overstretch your muscle, I'm happy, I'm satisfied. Let's talk about flexor withdrawal, which is a setup for an example, uh, a pretty good example of this IPSP, EPSP, because you will see that on the exam, and this, I hope, helps to clarify some of that type of information. So let's break down this slide. You can see the spinal cord prep. This individual steps on glass, stimulates pain. You've got um, two different muscle groups. You've got the uh, hamstrings and the quadriceps, right? The front and the back. One extends the leg, one flexes the leg. Well, the sensory information comes up, activates multiple interneurons, also sends signals up to the brain, but the information that comes down on the ipsilateral side, that's the same side, right? Ipsy meaning same. You've got ipsilateral information coming down that says flex. The ipsilateral flexor contracts, right? The ipsilateral flexor contracts of this right leg. Now, you also have an interneuron that crosses over. It doesn't have to go all the way up to the medulla. It crosses over. This is sending information to the contralateral limb, telling the extensor to contract so that you actually can stay balanced. You flex one leg and you extend the other. That's a very complicated motion that you don't even think about. And the coordination that's required here is not just the cerebrum to figure out, oh, man, I just stepped on something and that hurts. You're balancing, you're flexing one leg, you're extending the other leg, and you're balancing your cerebellum, which actually maintains posture and balance. Your cerebellum is lighting up because you're sitting there, you know, trying to balance so you don't fall over, knowing I don't want to put my foot down because I don't know where that is that I just cut myself. 
or it's a stingray, right? You, you got stung in the ocean or, you know, pick the example. This is a flexor withdrawal reflex. We call this polysynaptic reflex arc. Poly meaning many synapses because you got synapses on the ipsy side and synapses on the contralateral side. It's very complex. Now we've got this crossed extension reflex over on the left limb. So we've got a lot of things happening. This is the complexity of the human body. It's just a simple, you step on glass in the, in the ocean or you, you got stung by a stingray, you don't fall flat on your face, right, and, and risk getting more trauma. You can actually balance there and try to get out of danger. And now we know, okay, I've got my precentral gyrus, my postcentral gyrus, and my cerebellum all working in concert to make me stand here in the ocean, right? And then my, my occipital lobe's going, okay, there's blood dripping off the bottom. Think about all the neuronal pathways that are working in that situation when you have an injury. It's kind of cool when you think about it, right? The last piece of new material for today and for unit three is the Golgi tendon. So we talked about the muscle spindle and we talked about the Golgi tendon. If you move on in your studies, I will do you a disservice if we don't talk about these two structures because they'll come back up, the muscle spindle and the Golgi tendon. The Golgi tendon, in contrast to the muscle spindle, it gives you information about muscle tension. Muscle tension. So it's another pr protective mechanism found within the tendon of the muscle. The muscle spindle is found in the muscle portion. The Golgi tendon organ is part of the tendon because the muscle inserts into bone and this insertion um, segment is where the Golgi tendon exists, give you information about tension so you don't overstretch again your muscle. So let's look at this uh, reflex capability. So here we've got our quadriceps, our extensors. Here we have our hamstrings, our flexors. This joint it either extends this joint or it flexes this joint. The Golgi tendon gives you information coming in. You've got inner neurons that come right back the side. Information does go up to the brain. A lot of these preps don't show that. But this, this green inner neuron, there's a green inner neuron that's going up, myelinated fibers to the brain, letting you know what's happening. Let's follow the positive one, the purple one. The purple one comes here to the hamstrings and flexes. And it sends an inhibitory signal via red to the quadriceps extensor because you're overextending your leg. You don't want to hyperextend your leg. So as you get close to hyperextending your leg, you negatively inhibitory PSPs coming in, excitatory PSPs coming in to control the position of your limb so you don't overextend and do damage. So let me say that one more time. The Golgi tendon organ is located within the tendon that is part of the muscle inserting into the bone. That's the definition of a tendon. This, folks, is how I always remember tendons, our muscle to bone attachments, because I remember the Golgi tendon organ. And then I know ligaments are something different, right? So I know ligaments are bone to bone. And muscle to bone is the tendon because of the Golgi tendon. That's how I remember that. So I, did, I could never memorize it. I just had to remember, like, oh, I know what the Golgi tendon does. It's also kind of a weird name. But that's how I always remembered that. So this Golgi tendon is found within this quadriceps. It's also found in the hamstrings. But the example that we're using is this one in the quadriceps, where you've got a stretch, right, a stretch on tension by proprioception. And it fires this sensory afferent neuron that innervates onto two different neuro interneurons, <clears throat> plus a third one that goes up to the brain that's not shown. The positive efferent motor output, the positive goes to the hamstrings to flex and bring the leg in. 
The negative efferent goes to the quadriceps to prevent them from further extending. So the negative to the quadriceps would be inhibitory PSPs, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, and the signals going to the hamstrings, the flexors, would be excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Does that make sense? Okay. That's the new material that I have for you. We'll pause here. If you want to stay, I've got my time available until quarter after the hour, and I'm happy to just field some questions. Okay? If you're leaving, maybe do that somewhat quietly as best you can, maybe just with less talking. Don't answer your phone right away. If you're staying, we'll just shotgun it, raise your hand, and we'll, we'll see where we go with it. <laughs>